Lucy here uh, Talas Fliger, right? an associate professor in translation studies and English at Ivan Franco National University of Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, Talas Fliger is also a member of uh, Shevchenko Scientific uh, Society and a laureate of the Vigori Kultur, a literary prize. He's been a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, Marie Curie Skłodowska University, so our university. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear friends and colleagues, it's my pleasure to share some of my views, ideas, dealing with views, how can we apply axiology in translation studies, dealing with something, starting idea with cultural axiology, but axiology only is dealing with culture. So axiology generally deals with three ideas, values, evaluation, and norms. And in Ukrainian linguistics, this idea of evaluation is very well developed, while the idea of the theory of values is not so much. And that's why this idea uh, of my paper, of my report, is to identify the value of a specific text, if, if any, to find the criteria for comparability and to indicate the influence on the target language. Uh, the material of the research is the Catechism by, written by St. Petrom uh, Mohila in uh, uh, 1640 under the title The Orthodox Confession of the Apostolic, uh, of Catholic and Apostolic Eastern Church, which was later approved by all Eastern patriarchs and which was served as the main fundamental text, the religious text for all Eastern churches within two centuries. From the viewpoint of translations, we have to deal with three textual traditions, right? First of all, this is the, uh, which would then be called the Little Catechism, uh, which was published in 1645, uh, first in Polish, then in Middle Ukrainian, and which was translated in 1996 by Valery Sutyuk. Then there is this uh, 1643, the Latin text translated in Kiev and which was later translated uh, in uh, 1975 into English by uh, Reverend Dr. Ronald Peter Popivchuk. And uh, then we have this another Greek uh, uh, tradition of uh, Greek catechism, which was, uh, comes from the 1666 version just of the Greek language publication, which was already translation of the Latin translation of produced in Kiev, but uh, not only authored but partially changed by Melitia Sirigus, who was not only a translator but one of the uh, famous the theologians of this time, and which became the editor of Principles for all other translations, of, especially for the 1695 Latin translation by uh, Lawrence Norman, six, uh, 1762 English language translation by Philip Lodwell, and a new Ukrainian translation, no translation into new Ukrainian by Reverend M. M. Kumka. There are different, uh, there are three main approach, uh, approaches to define values, right? So we have sign as a sign of objects of reality, as a transcendental world, and as an expression of an individual human will. That's this, the final one, the sad one, the subjective approach is most important just for translation, uh, trans uh, uh, translation and textual analysis. So uh, uh, that's why we should uh, focus on the attributive nature of values and their relation to the will of a person, speaker, or a community. Hence, a value is any object that has connection with objective properties as well as with the potential ability to represent needs, interests, and goals of a person. So we may apply uh, the um, definition of Ukrainian uh, researcher Sukhina that values are the anthropomorphic senses which being mental units of consciousness which determine the specific features of perception, of imagination of a person and act as an eternal motivation factor in his or her sense creating life and activities. And this is the key uh, idea which we have that each text, each activity is sense creating activities. Within text we want still to say something more and to deal um, to render our needs, interests, and goals. Right? So translation can be described as an action on a separate lexical system according to a certain beliefs, adopting to an, uh, adop adapting to another culture and reality. Having these three um, <coughs> uh, textual traditions will deal with the system of terms which is possible to grasp, to uh, extract from all these texts, and we cannot use this full text just to have this 
uh, text as comparability. So for us, value is a peculiar semantic parameter and uh, usually a custom that uh, axiological means polarity, right, and especially deals with um, evaluation, ugly, uh, beautiful, good, bad, pleasant, unpleasant. So the polar, polar nature of values in the text lies in their presence. So values either exist or they don't exist. Um, so the purposes of translation access assessment are correlated with the idea of modeling as a process of constructing a real or imaginary object for experiencing the world which satisfies the requirements of comparability and systemicity. And axiological modeling means that the translator converts the lexical microsystem according to their own or accepted values. Uh, for axiological models, we can use the term repertoire of values, which is a set of personal or cultural dependent features of the assessed phenomenon. So we select values out of the meaning of the lexeme, or a group of lexemes, which are fundamentals to describing the context or situation. Right? And we always remember that values exist in the experience. So religious experience should have a lot to do with religious experience. Uh, a system of terms uh, can also be considered as a closed or self-sufficient lexicosemantic group and thus the reproduction of the value of key terms uh, thus can guarantee the equivalence of reproducing the author's aim even if there are various textual traditions as we have in our case. In our case we have to deal with three textual traditions, four languages three uh, uh, versions of uh, Ukrainian language and two, uh, two, versions of, uh, two versions of English language, right? So the analysis of the term system ought to cover both special terms, which is just very specific, uh, let's say with us case it's theological terms, general terms, and even special vocabulary, for example, as the term brand, which uh, can develop as a specific term just in a um, in a given uh, discipline, right? Uh, due to the uh, dynamism and openness of the discipline and its uh, uh, term system. Uh, dealing with the case study of the sacraments, uh, we can refer that it here we cannot only refer to the biblical context, but we might think that it may be important to deal with the denominational experience. Right? And uh, the two main uh, approaches we can still try to use to identify values, these are etymological and uh, contextual approach. So from the viewpoint of the history of the word sacrament, which comes from the Greek uh, the word uh, mysterion, we have this uh, multiplicity of values, right? So divinity, divine inspiration, loyalty, oath to God, interaction between God and man. And this is the case which absolutely derives from the Greek word mysterion, which came to the theologian multiplicity, interpreting it both as a divine act, as a symbol, and as a connection between God and man. So all these senses are usually flawless, uh, uh, rendered in all languages only two values, divinity and divine inspiration. And this idea of loyalty, Oath to God, interaction between God and man, they are uh, not always uh, rendered valid, especially when we take the case of Ukrainian times, all right? And how is it rendered in the dictionary, of the academic dictionary of the Ukrainian language? The dictionary was published in the time of the Soviet epoch, right? And the definition is that this is a, a ritual, which is just possible to say that, which has a magical power. For sure, just if we see a, red, uh, a black cat and we just spit three times over the left hand, this is the magical force, we expect that this one. But sacraments and absolutely has nothing to do with any magical force. We have to build our connections and relations with God, and we are baptism, confirmation, communion. We just somehow just trying to become God's citizens, citizens of the God's uh, state, and just absolutely just to see our role in this system of world. In the sacrament of ba uh, baptism, uh, due to the uh, contextual approach, we can deduce two main values, right? This is thingness. Why thingness? Because it's manifested through things, so there is this. Um, water, there is a verbal form, you are even just spirit, just as the blow of uh, air can be interpreted as symbol. 
something just uh, in Polish this is Krzesz and some in Middle Ukrainian this idea is cross, yes, which is also object was used as an object for the ritual, right? But there is another uh, uh, value which is also important for uh, uh, the Orthodox priests are absolutely crazy about this, the nature, the idea of naturalness. So the definition is the, that for baptism you have to use the water which bore itself. What does it mean that the water can bear itself, right? So it means that it should be just absolutely pure, natural things. And here we just point that what in Catholicism is not so much important, and it goes to St. Thomas Aquinas, right? We, who definitely and very rationally explained that there is no necessity to use pure water because pure water does not exist in real life so yes but this idea just to put how it deals with uh, this idea of uh, so, uh, relations to God that they just uh, value of naturalness is important for orthodox text uh, there is an, another question that how the accompanying attributes like prepon, debitum, proper, pristoine correspond to this idea of value of naturalness or thinness do they boost or discard this value and we must admit that, that if Greek lexing emphasizes the correspondence to the roots the Latin term just especially in patristic literature it developed the senses of uh, respect church fee even sin fine as a punishment right so it may uh, somehow just deal with the clo the closest context can contribute to this idea of um, thinness or properness, right? It's only the English language which has this value of naturalness, perfection, refined impurity. Even in Ukrainian, the original, we don't have this idea of uh, naturalness in the uh, accompanying attributes. Uh, speaking about the, uh, the the sacrament of charism or confirmation, right? The Orthodox doctrine doctrine teaches that the gifts of the Holy Spirit should be obtained by prayer, faith, and good deals. It means that we approach this value of labor, which is absolutely neglected in the uh, Greek, uh, so in the, uh, this, uh, in the textual tradition of the great uh, catechism, due to another object of conceptualization, the translator, right? This Miletus Sri who just introduced these ideas that it's not so much important because um, uh, Petroma Hiller just used only the biblical quotations this is uh, the second epistle to Corinthians God who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our heart this earnest is a typical economical term which expresses the beginning of the contract so Chris brings not the gift to us. It's not something what we receive just out of nothing, right? It's something that the God said that you will receive this, but you have to work upon this. When we, uh, when we deal with the sacrament of communion, the macro value is the, uh, is the value of memory, right? Even just uh, the synonymic usage that the trauma Hiller used the term borrowed from Polish, in Polish culture it's accepted as Vyacheza Pańska and Petromo um, Hela used Tajemna Vyacheza Pańskaya, which for sure comes from the New Testament, right? But via this he wanted to underline in a way the Catholic approach to the text, uh, described still by uh, St. Thomas of, of Aquinas, that uh, the, uh, the liturgy usually commemorates the sacrifice, the memorial of death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the communion, right, the consumption and participation in the later sacrifice. And here we come again to this idea of bread. What kind of value of memory lies in the symbol of bread, right? Bread, which was the symbol of fertility in the Old Testament, because just as a symbol of God's gift of the human kind. And that's why when uh, we meet the term, this eternal salvation, the salvation usually is a short act, right? So there is no way of making it eternal, right? Something which should be short, we expect what will be after it, right? This value is uh, violated uh, in, the, um, in some translations and in some language versions. 
in the, uh, in the sacrament of marriage, we can deduce two main values. This is mutual consent and social responsibility. And here we should pay attention just to this table, how to have just, this is in the first line, you have Ukrainian language, Greek, uh, Latin, and English, and in the columns, you have practically four basic values which are actualized in this term, right? So, in all Ukrainian terms, the basic term was brak, which meant uh, wedding, ceremony, right? So, when Petro Mohyla applied this uh, Polish term malzhenstvo, which comes still from this old Germanic root mal, contract, he wanted to underline back in the mid 17th century this idea of mutual consent because even the idea of union, supersus or conjugal marriage, they have this idea of that you are to be together, you want it or not, you are joined. And this um, uh, this uh, old Slavonic verb supersus comes from the old uh, Slavonic verb sopraste, not only to unite but to harness. You harness bulls in order to plow the land. We, now we have this uh, absolutely interesting um, value in the English term, which, which again comes from the Latin one, but this enters into motherhood. Uh, when we speak about the, extreme, the sacrament of extreme unction, right, which is, has the widest range of synonyms in Ukrainian, and within the synonyms, we may say that each synonym will cause a new set of terms, a new paradigms of terms, which will underline the different value. For example, if we speak about Soborovania, we'll underline the value of joint action, right? Which will explain why you need so many priests to perform this uh, sacrament. When we think about Maslo Svetia, we will again stress more the value of thingness, right? And very interesting that for Petro Mohila, the basic value was healing. So for sure he regarded it as that it's in connection with the healing of uh, salvation of sins and then healing of body as a result of salvation of sins, that's fine. But he uh, voiced it back in the mid-1640, uh, right? When in Catholic uh, Church, a huge change happened uh, after the Second Vatican Council when they changed the main term of extreme unction into the anointing of the sick in the 1970s. Uh, what does this idea of uh, discussion of uh, values of the sacraments can give us for understanding of text, interpreting text, and for translation types, right? So we can deduce that culturally motivated values are a semantic parameter in a lexical group which represents a special way of actualizing information in the perception of key ideas in the worldview, and which is shaped by the national language culture and the author's intention in the text. I use the term language culture, which was offered by the French researcher Jean-Pierre Lamiral back in the 1980s, meaning that we not only translate, but we also translate some connections with the culture of the social and historical conditions of the nation. The question whether an atheist, a Protestant, can properly understand all these values in the text, we have to yes, even despite uh, that we have to deal with his prerequisites and intentions, he can identify all the values of the text. The idea of the repertoire of values it is not so uh, important just to show that we have a big difference between uh, uh, Orthodox and Catholic encounter, right? And generally it's very interesting to say that in um, I'm just I'm going just to skip some. Um, this idea will show that uh, generally in this uh, uh, Orthodox Catholic descent, there is not so much big deals of the uh, divisions when we speak about values of perceiving uh, religious uh, matters. Right. So we have to apply just two uh, approaches, uh, etymological and contextual, which will complement each other because etymological will try to identify the historical and cultural context, and contextual approach will help us uh, to build the balance between the individual act, the author's just intention, and the social act, right, the community's approval. 
for sure that if, if there is some deviations when you speak about the repertoire values, then they are not just so much extensive, so that for sure that you can guess without the analysis, replacing, adding, losing them. But we have to deal that we cannot describe this repertoire in the table, reproduce, non-reproduce, because we always deal that uh, the values are shaped by cultural and historical and social and philosophical reasons of their formation. So as far as the text loses its connection with the police system, with the police system of the source culture, right, the communication is successful if the reproduction of values is sufficient, since there is no violation of the author's intention. Thank you. Uh, Another term which I would like us to still to discuss is the cultural metrics, which we can s discuss as an acquired uh, set of judgments, value coding, and semantic networks of maps. And we may deal it just, uh, it, it will push us to discuss the idea of equivalence, right? Especially when you want to think about cultural equivalence. And to set this uh, essence of cultural dimensions of equivalence, the synchronic and diachronic. What does not exist now may appear or may not appear in the future, right? The cases for this is the idea of theanthropies, right? Which is usually applies to the idea of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has both divine and human nature, but at the same time, right, we can apply to God Father, right? So here we have we should discuss four principles. Two of them were discussed by uh, Fyodor Russian linguist Fyodor Buslav back in 1848 in his paper just Influence on Christianity on the Development of the Slavonic Language, where he claimed that the translator of the first of this old Ukrainian gospel in 1056 uh, were so good that they didn't use pagan vocab to express Christian values, and that uh, all this Asian vocab is family based. And Christianity, vice versa, developed the social and state shaping concept. We can also question that whether we can use the Protestant principles of Sola Scriptura to interpret religious texts, and whether we can speak about the mutual transmissibility of language from the viewpoint of the difference of conceptual structures. Right? Here it comes to the budget of the God. There are different ways of naming it. Here I've just collected all the names of gods used in all the translations, and the first observation is that there is no linear correspondence between them. So the very translators change whatever they want. Why? Because there is a big difference in the language, right? Whatever was a clear balance for Petromo, for Saint Petromo Hill between the human and divine nature is not so much in the very language, right? He paid attention to this. In contemporary Ukrainian, we have three lexemes, so we may have a thing about the idea of spectrum, right? That we have transitioned from the divine essence via the blur territory or ambivalent zone or dual zone to the human nature. So in contemporary new Ukrainian language, we have three lexemes, Osoba, Istota, Yestua, which relate to a human, which is person. Two lexemes, both Bojestua, which are du dual, and only one, Bojestua Prada, which is pure divine. In English, it's vice versa. Three lexemes, essence, divinity, Godhead, are purely, uh, it refers only to divinity. And three lexemes, God, person, nature, they will stay in ambivalent zone. Uh, trying to think that Jesus Christ is a purely social uh, uh, essence, we can apply the idea of linguistic and cultural space as an interpretive model and just try to see that there are closer associates with which um, Professor Ukrainian researcher Medivine Andrychuk refers as the inner horizon and there are related concepts uh, connected with this idea which are this outer concept and for example when we take this one of the names of Judas Christ is anointed, Messiah, anointed why is he anointed? because we will um, Anointment in uh, uh, ancient oriental culture meant this legal status, the elevation of the legal status, right? It was manumission of the slave woman, it was the transfer of the property, it was the bet betrothal of brides, right? So in the inner horizon, we have the association of the supreme authority of the state of the church, right? In the outer horizon, we'll have the associations connected, connected with the state system or the state hierarchy, right? Um, especially, um, Jesus Christ was anointed for three services, for priesthood, 
for kingdom and for prophecy as it is stated in the Catechism. And here we have this idea what is Uriat and what is Kronev's for kingdom, right? So Uriat, which is just the way that Jesus Christ was to dedicate oneself to serve God, which is almost uh, lost in translations, right? Because this legal position and office in the term, they, are, they, they have to do a lot with the absolutely political um, life but they are not dealing with religious life, right? And then there is a very interesting term, uh, idea of Kralevsko, right? Just um, king. Judas Christ is a king. So in text he is called, he is connected with Kralevsko, and he is called Cisar Judeski, the king of Jews, right? Two terms, Kralevsko and Cisarsko, is a, par a paradoxically human, because they come from the name of real names. Kralevsko comes from the uh, name of the Frankish emperor Charlemagne, and Cisarsko comes from the uh, name of the Roman uh, Emperor Ju Julius Caesar, right? Another time when we might speak about this Bavitel, which uh, St. Petro Mohila searched at the time, what, how can we describe the function of Jesus Christ in the real life as a rescuer, as a liberator, right? And he didn't use some uh, old terms which are connected as spas or spasite, right? So, at that time, he had two terms, and I've just chosen this uh, the comp table which compares uh, two terms in old Ukrainian, so we mean stands till the 13th century, and new, uh, new Ukrainian, just that's 11th, uh, the 21st century, and you may see that old Ukrainian lexing spas is a purely a theoanthropic term, because it has rescue, it has value, it has its essence of divinity in it. Plus, simultaneously, it has this essence describing its human nature. Uh, another problem which we have with describing Christ is this allegorical in this way. That we have to deal with uh, Jesus Christ is word and lamb, right? Two main allegories, right? This logos has absolutely nothing to do with word, which may be usually just misinterpreted by uh, contemporary language culture. But those who deal with Greek culture, they know that logos has approximately 40 senses. That's counting, that's reasoning, that's understanding, that's discussion, that's seeing, right? And the word sense, word is already something like number 32 or 36 out of 40. So it means that the theological idea that Jesus Christ is the reason or intelligence which is expressed either internally in thinking or externally in speech, but it is still higher mind. And we may try to think over that, to use the idea of Anna Slusher, just to refer to the such, how, what types of metrics we can use. Ethics categories, ethic models, and ideological uh, intentions, right? So which in the text we have perfection and correctness, which perfectly well overlap with uh, Greek language culture and don't overlap with English and Ukrainian parts. And, but it doesn't mean that we should accept it, uh, that accept it as a problem. It's fine. This problem of uh, uh, not acceptance in the culture will con can be considered. It can coexist in culture and produce no big problems for understanding and interpreting the very text. Uh, why the Saint Petromohola used the term Baranok, which has correlation with the pre Christian mental, which despite the fact that it denoted Jesus Christ, but it also has some this way of idea of primordial fertility, dignity, wealth, he was not afraid. Though he could use the old Bulgarian word Ahnet, which had this tradition in most Ukrainian in Ukrainian translation. Similarly, when we discuss the idea of lamb, we may recall one a very interesting sense connected with uh, soldiers of uh, Luton and Kirk who produced and uh, who killed somebody. And then in the 17th, 18th century, so the words lamb meant cruel, ruthless soldier. In the 19th century, there was the sense for people who interfered in the political process of election. In the 20th century, this sense disappeared. So we may speak that the cultural metrics can resist new senses. At the same time, we may think that this text may be present precedence for uh, be reactualized in future, right? Thinking about conclusions, we may think that conceptual system can be absorbed or not, right? So, but this won't happen so quickly, right? 
uh, and we shouldn't be afraid that there may be just be some uh, inner conflicts of the text with the target culture. This happens, and that's not a problem. Can we use the idea of sola scriptura? No, we have to use the pr principle of prima scriptura, which shows, in which in orthodoxy and Catholicism means the use of the Bible and the sacred tradition, but in philological understanding, it means that we have to use etymological, historical, dictionaries, and encyclopedias to understand the broad world viewpoint of biblical context. So does the mutual translatability of languages exist? It does, despite the fact that Fundamental metrics will promote or resist further formation of certain values in accordance with certain traditional metaphors. And yes, axiological analysis in translation quality assessment shows that every nation sees God in its own.